How often have you walked into a room full of strangers and felt uncomfortable? Do you know how to work a room? Are you a networking pro? After you watch today's interview with Susan Rowan, you'll never again worry about what to say to be remembered or how to work a room effectively. Susan's best-selling book, how to Work a Room, has sold more than a million copies, one of which sits on my bookshelf. Susan is a wealth of knowledge and she shares some incredible tips about how to become a savvy networker, why and how social media has completely changed the game, and how to use small talk to win people over. I know you're going to love it, so sit back and enjoy. Hello everyone. Today I am extremely excited to welcome to the show Susan Roan. Susan is the best-selling author of How to Work a Room, the quintessential book that gives real, valuable, and actionable steps on how to network. Not just smile and wave and everything's going to work out okay, those generic tips that you hear. We're going to get into the nitty-gritty. Now, the silver edition of How to Work a Room has sold over a million copies in 13 different countries, and she is an in-demand international keynote speaker. She has written articles for New York Times, CNN, Forbes, BuzzFeed, Huffington Post, so much more, and her client list includes Coca-Cola, Kraft Food, the U.S. Air Force, Yale University, Apple, and even the NFL. She's been featured on so many podcasts, and we are glad that she has taken time out of her very busy schedule to be with us here today. So thanks for joining us, Susan. Well, thank you. And one addition, that we now have a new country because we just sold rights to How to Work a Room to Vietnam. To Vietnam, I've got some great friends there right now. Oh, well, you'll have to let them know. I, I offered to go over and do some promotion um, if they'd like to send me. But that, and this is something I'd love to point out to our listeners. There's so much in life you cannot plan. Who would think that a book that's literally 28 years old next month would sell rights after all those years? But... Um, I was hoping there'd be some more new countries that might want to buy it. But yes, that's, that's my news. I just got that news last week. I was very excited. That is exciting. And I'm sure there are going to be many more to come because as we'll talk about today, this skill set in particular is probably one of the most valuable that anyone can learn. You know, it's interesting. I've had people say to me, because, you know, I speak for a living. Oh, we want to listen to the hard skills. Um, we, we're not interested in soft skills. To which I say, really, if it was so soft, how come it's so hard for you to do it? Because working a room is tough, it's often daunting, and it's essential because it's really about connecting with people. Absolutely. Now, before we get into everything, I'd like for you to tell everyone or share with everyone in your own words what it is that you do. In addition, I know that you're a public speaker, you're an author, you're so much more, but what do you consider yourself? Uh, I think of myself, and this is very interesting because my first career was as a public school teacher. Um, I like to think of myself as the person who gives permission to people to talk to other people because so many people wait on the sidelines. However, also being a former teacher, I have to tell you, here are five easy tips how to do that. And so I think it's my way of saying, if I had a magic wand and I could wave it over everyone, the gift I would give to them would be the comfort and confidence to talk to anyone and everyone in any situation, because you never know where the golden nugget is going to come from. I love it. That, and it's, it's so true, because you never know, and so many people... How many times do people look back and say, I wish I would have, I could have, or I should have said something to that one person, and it could have changed the trajectory of their life forever? And you know what? I'm glad you brought that up, because what I want to say to our audience is, don't think I always do that. But I made the mistake one time of listening to a friend who said, oh, you know, uh, don't bother him. First of all, he said, I think that so-and-so, who is a well-known rocker, um, and I listened to him, and I still feel I owe that other person an apology because he did me a favor. Do not hang with people who want you to hang back from doing and being what you'd like to do. And by the way, I still give that friend grief. I will never let it go. But I learned my lesson, and I want to tell you what I did. I was, at, I was speaking for a manufacturing group, 
near Universal City. So I had a little time. I went over to, you know, Universal City. And as I'm walking, I see Sugar Ray Leonard. And I'm like, oh, my God. And so I just said to the stranger next to me, I think that's Sugar Ray Leonard. And he says, well, yeah, it is. And I thought about the time that I listened to someone that didn't do this. So I waited till he was finished, whatever. And I went over and I said, I would be so honored on behalf of all the women my age, if I could take a picture of you. So he was already smiling. And here's what he said. He said, oh, no, no, not a picture of me. He took my phone, gave it to his assistant and said, a picture of us together. What? I was astonished, pleasant, kind smile, took a picture, and I said, thank you so much, you've made my day. And he said, where are you going? Let's see if the picture turned out. Uh, where? Oh, yeah! And then when I gave my presentation the next day, I juxtaposed those two stories. The fact that I listened to someone that kept me from meeting someone, and that I used that as a lesson to say, I would have missed out on this lovely man who was an icon to all of us who was in LA at the time to raise funds for diabetes research because of his dad, which my mom also had diabetes, which I happen to mention to him. So here's the point. In your life, when you go through your daily, whatever you do, be respectful of people don't interfere with their whatever if they're a famous person or someone in your community that's well known but don't not do what you want to do because i promise you i'm still regretting what i didn't do listen to yourself and as long as you're appropriate you can have just wonderful experiences i love it uh, what what great wisdom just to start off the show we haven't even gotten into the meat and potatoes of the questions and we're already digging up gold now, so when it comes to networking, communication, working a room, where did your passion for this start? How did, how did you start piecing together everything that would later become this multi-million best-selling book? This is so interesting because someone when they asked me, because I, I spoke on how to work a room before I wrote the book. And I spoke on networking before I wrote the book. But I remember someone said to me, how did you learn how to work a room? I'm originally from Chicago, though I've lived in San Francisco for many years. And I remember thinking about it and looking at them and saying, what learned? My mother made me. Oh, oh, it's a family, you know, a wedding. Susan, go talk to my family from Toronto. Uh, make sure they don't talk to so-and-so here. I was 12. Big job. But I was expected. And my mother was a great role model of it. She talked to people. She always had a fun story. My grandfather, her father, was a wonderful storyteller. But my mother, it's like welcome people. So I learned that concept of be the host. In another era, and believe me, I know I'm saying this quite old school-ish, we would have called that bride training welcome people, be a good host, extend yourself, have something to have a conversation with, have a story to tell, listen to what people say. And if you have enough experiences, you can share a story or if you don't know something, and here's my magic. I didn't know that. Tell me more. I didn't know that. I, I am really not the, I'm going to take extra courses online but if you talk to people you can learn what they know because they're happy to share it but please if you're a good cook don't call me and say i can tell you how to make souffles because i don't care there are restaurants who do that so really to me this is just the way i was raised and if you weren't raised that way here's a hint from my mother extend yourself welcome people be nice to them and the overall is make them feel comfortable with you. And how I pieced together the book is I was speaking on the subject, teaching it. I went to many events in San Francisco where I observed behaviors. And the best role models for behavior were the people who did it wrong. Because I'd go back to my little group and say, what do you think of this jerk? Look what they did. What would you do? 
And that way I got a lot of input. And I think it's because I was a teacher and I knew how to do lesson plans. I knew how to construct a one day workshop, which I gave at UCLA and San Francisco State and UC Berkeley. What can I teach you that you can walk away with and add it into your actionable steps that will make your business grow, give you a career change? And by the way, I started writing about career change because I'm a laid off teacher from San Francisco and I designed probably one on the first of the West Coast of career change te uh, for teacher workshops. So it all mushroomed out of things that I didn't think would happen. I thought I was in a career for life. And by the way, if there are any ex-teachers listening, remember they said, oh, it's a sure fallback plan? Not that good of a fallback plan. They laid off 1,200 teachers. So I actually did fall, um, but I bounced back. Maybe that's what they mean. Brenda, maybe that's what they mean. It's a fallback plan. You bounce back. But I did it not to create a business. Oh, let me see what heck I can do to create a business. I did it because my friends, the teachers were calling and said, they're laying us off. What are we going to do? And then I said, mm, me telling them isn't going to help. Maybe if I go and do some research, I can find a workshop and design a workshop that will help teachers decide what they're good at, what they could do, et cetera. And that's what I did. And you took, you took this big fuzzy, I, nobody knows how to do it and brought it down to the tactical level and took your expertise as a teacher and took bite-sized chunks and laid it out. Well, I did it. Something else I did. I, when I was a member of women entrepreneurs here in San Francisco, which is where I learned how to be an entrepreneur, because before that I thought promotion meant you send a kid to fifth grade from fourth grade. And I know that's not what they meant. Um, I had people say something. I didn't understand why I was getting a little blowback. And I said to one of the other women, what's going on? And she says, well, you know, Susan, a lot of people think that you just walk into the room and talk to everyone. You might want to low key it. And Brandon, I actually thought about it for a week. And I want to tell all of our people listening, when you hear anyone give you advice to tell you how to be less than who you are, bye-bye. You're gone. Uh, I sound just like Seth Meyers on You're Burned. Um, I didn't listen. What I did is I thought about it for a week, and believe it or not, quite like almost Fiddler on the Roof, I saw my grandmother in a dream, and I kind of heard her whisper, Susan, we didn't have money, but what we gave you was the ability to talk to people because you went to so many family dinners in Canada and here, big extended families. And then I really had the courage to say to her, well, thank you. And she asked me if, what I planned to do, and I said, um, just do what I did. And what I've been doing. So what I did then is I asked someone to follow me around because this was so second nature to me. I didn't know what I was doing. And someone followed me around and watched me and took notes and then debriefed with me. And that's part of how I could do those chunks and those tactics of what you do to work a room. Now I know you said that they're old school tactics, but I think they're not necessarily old school. They're just proven. And that's what has helped your book and your system endure such the test of time. Oh, gosh, I am going to quote you on that. The next time someone says, yeah, you're all so old school, I'm going to say, I am proven. Brandon Slater said so. Quoting you. And by the way, I want the audience to hear what I just said. I'm quoting you. I didn't say I'm plagiarizing you. I'm not attributing to you. The best thing you can do to set yourself apart from people is give credit where credit is due. Absolutely. I, every, everyone learns from someone and you have to acknowledge that. Exactly. It's not that people are going to think you didn't create things on your own. They're going to think you have ethics and integrity. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Now, 
when we go to to working this room, this this fabulous natural experience that you happen to have that had and had to have someone break it down for you, what would you say is the biggest difference between networking and working a room? Oh, they're two totally different skills. Now they mesh perfectly. Working a room is when you walk into that event and there's food and drink and maybe music and lots of people. Um, it's the circulating. The uh, proven word for it is socializing, mingling. In fact, I trademarked the mingling maven. Um, it's, that's what we do at a party, at a conference, at an event. Networking is the follow-up that we do. So you could be great. Here's how I could prove it. A, I wrote two separate books with no repetition. But you can go into a room at any event, have a great time. But if you don't have follow-up, you don't have relationships, you don't have contacts, you don't have a network. But if you're a good networker, you do what you say you're going to do. You follow up. You provide the article. You make the introduction. You make the call. You invite someone to LinkedIn. And by the way, not just send them the generic LinkedIn invitation. You also say, by the way, I really enjoyed meeting you at the Leukemia Society fundraiser. Help us out. We can't remember anything. Um, so that's for personalizing your LinkedIn um, invite. But, but then what you do is you, you stay in touch. So socializing is the first thing, but the staying in touch, the picking up the phone, the sending the email, making the comment in LinkedIn. Um, if you have someone's cell phone, it's whatever holiday is coming up, Halloween, Thanksgiving, you know, New Year's, send a little um, emoji or something that says happy whatever. It's a way of staying in touch. That's what savvy networkers do. So. You could be good at working room and not be good at networking, and you could be a great networker and still find that walking into a room full of people is disconcerting and uncomfortable. So we want to have both skills because they, oh, look at this. I'm glad I did my nails because I just saw you all saw them. Um, they, they intertwine. So you want both skills. I, I love that you added the ending of, you can be a great networker, but still be and have anxiety about walking into that situation. Because I think so many people just attribute networking as the skill set that some people have, and they're just the best at it, and, and that's what it is. I'm just bad. And it's not true at all. And I love that you focus so much on the follow up because that's what nine out of 10 people don't ever do, and that's what separates it. And our mutual friend, Patricia Fripp, once told me that she says to her audiences, she said, I might not be the, the most smart person in the room. Well, I don't know anything about physics, so for sure not. But she said, I have the best follow-up. And she does. When she says I'm going to do something, she does it. Um, I just, I didn't even tell these two people that I was going to introduce them. But I was interviewed by someone who lives in Atlanta. And because I made my usual Chicago deep dish pizza statement, by the way, a big thing to know in Chicago, where you eat your deep dish pizza, it also causes fights with New Yorkers who just fold it and put it in their mouth. And you'll notice what I just did. Sometimes we connect with people about things that have nothing to do with business. And if we give a little more information, you already know I'm from Chicago, I eat deep, deep dish pizza, I understand the New York thing about their flat pizza. They just roll up and put in their mouth. If you give a little bit more in your conversation, you help give people something that they can respond to or connect with. But this one was from Atlanta. And then she said, oh, my goodness, I went to Northwestern, which was not that far from my house. Another woman that I met recently is Atlanta-based. She's also an author. She has a business. I just met her. Uh, a week ago in New York, they didn't know I was going to do that. I did an e-intro. You're both in Atlanta. You're both writers. You're both, you know, very involved in this business community. 
So really the savvy networker really is, and may I take a page from a proven tactic, nothing more than a matchmaker. Do you put people together? Oh, you hire a friend that says, oh, I'm really looking for a good graphic artist. Do you say, oh, I know so-and-so and I've done some work with them. Let me introduce you. There are people that say, well, I don't network. I, I really hate it. Did you ever recommend a restaurant? Then you're a networker. Recommend a movie? You're a networker. Recommend a me mechanic? Or ask someone for a recommendation. That's what networking is. It's the sharing. It's a mutually beneficial process whereby we share ideas, leads, information, and if we're lucky, laughter. And I think the most successful people that I've had the chance to talk to, meet, and interview are some of the most sharing and most giving people that I've ever met. I'm really glad you said that because you said this, and I want to be clear. There are people out on the circuit teaching people give first. But it's done with the essence of what are you going to get back? Right. And, and that is so antithetical. Is it antithetical to opposite of what really living a life of networking and sharing is? Let me tell you, I, have, I work out with a trainer. You probably can't tell. But he's also a Presbyterian minister who no longer has a congregation, though he still performs the usual services. Um, and I've been to hear him, actually, at the local Presbyterian church give a sermon. By the way, he gives me sermons. Five more reps. I'm so tired of that. But um, I watched him. I, I don't go to a new mechanic. If I, have an, if I have something that's happened in my business or my personal life, I will run it by him. Now, he's had pastoral counseling. That's what he does. I will watch. I feel like his head does a 360-degree turn, and I can see him cogitate on the issue I brought up, and then I get pastoral counseling. But I didn't understand. You're not, you're not a minister anymore, but you do all these things, and you put people together. And then he said something to me, and he said, Susan, if someone asks me a question, and I know the answer, or I know the right person, why wouldn't I give that to them? And then, Brandon, I had this epiphany that is his ministry. The person who really lives the life of giving, sharing, supporting, helping, that's networking because we give that that name. But that really is the essence of what I think is le leading a character-driven life. And, and I think one of the things that's just happened as we're having this conversation, we keep coming back to saying networking and networking. And it it is a word that is so overused and it has so many connotations and isn't even close to what I really feel that relationship building is. It doesn't give it justice. No, it doesn't. And in fact, before I even wrote How to Work Room, so I would have to say 30 years ago, I wrote an article that got published in a, ma a magazine called Networking Beyond the Buzzword. 30 years ago, we, we have that, that's the ebook that I wrote, because of course I decided to plagiarize my own writing. <laughs> uh, so networking beyond the buzzword. By the way, it's a great ebook. You should get that. Um, it's a, and we misuse the word. And we don't have another word for what I'm talking about, connecting. Um, I know people have made up these stupid words. Oh, I don't want to use the word networking, so I'm going to make up a word. I think I've sent this tweet 10 times. I don't care if you call it jello pudding. Call it what you are. It's, the, it's really the essence of living life as your best person to the fullest. I love that. That's incredible. And now, and I think when you, when you think about it and you're going with that attitude, when someone says, I can't network or how do I get ready or how do I prepare to work a room? It makes it so much easier because if you go in with that mindset of helpful, generous, honest, interested, it's going to make that a lot easier. But I know you've got some other tips for how someone can prepare. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So now we're at the tactical, Susan. Tactical things. Okay. First of all, 
this is going to sound really Pollyanna-ish, but while you'll hear other people say, have an agenda, have your goals, I say, really? You think anyone walked into that room to have a drink and an hors d'oeuvre to make your agenda come true? No. If you walk in anywhere with an agenda, we can all tell, and we're running away from you because it's so obvious. So I'm going to give you the Rowan version. Number one, go everywhere to number one, have a good time. Because as though that might sound hedonistic, but if you go to have a good time, the room works you. People don't walk into the room and say, oh, look, there's an unhappy person I want to meet. You're having a good time. They're going, oh, that person must be open, and they look like they're fun. It makes you approachable. So you said it, Brandon. There's two things to this idea of working a room and mingling. Be interesting, but be interested. Be the person who can approach people, but also make yourself approachable. Body language does that. And when I give my talks, I actually have a very interesting, I make everyone get up on their feet and do this, and then we process it out. The two things people say make you approachable, eye contact and a smile. We don't go over to that person ever. We go over to the person that is welcoming. So that's the first thing. Second, prepare your own self-introduction. Rarely will your Brandon introduce you as you start. You will walk into a room, and even if you go with someone else, you might be on your own introducing yourself. So here's what you do before you go anywhere. Take the five minutes to plan and practice your self-introduction. I'm going to give you the three Rowan caveats. It's seven to nine seconds, which is the time frame of a pleasantry. It's not a 30 second upchucking of your elevator speech. Whoever did that and has come up with that, I'm thinking nobody even wants to hear that, least of all in an elevator. <laughs> I was in New York in a tiny elevator at my hotel and we had some fun conversations with people from all over the world. And no one really came out with a 30-second upchucking of who they are and their benefits. If I could give people a gift, it would be impromptu commentary, off-the-cuff commentary. Because of that, in a small elevator in New York a number of years ago, I ended up getting tickets in the VIP section to The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Who knew that the guy in the elevator worked for Comedy Central. I mean, it just, just so happens that I made an off-the-cuff remark. So I think be a little less stylized in some of these circumstances that you mm -hmm. find yourself. But if you have a seven to nine second self-introduction, it's, it's, it's a pleasantry. Second thing, tie it to the event you're going to. When you introduce yourself, Give people a context for why you are there so they know what they could say to you. You won't introduce yourself at a soccer game the same way you're going to introduce yourself at a, an entrepreneurial summit or a leukemia society benefit or your kid's soccer game. You know, tailor it. And then third comes from our mutual friend Patricia Fripp, extraordinary speaker and executive speech coach. She said to me once, Rowan, Tell them not to give their title. Give the benefit of what you do. When you give the benefit of what you do, you give people the opportunity to ask the first question and think they started the conversation. I love that. Now, let's take Oh, I'm that. sorry. Oh, here's the other part. I am so it. sorry. Go for it. That's just your intro. Here's okay. what you have to do. This is teacher Susan Rowan. In order to feel confident that you can make conversation about anything, read the paper. I don't care if you read it online. I used to make a joke and say, or on your watch like Dick Tracy, but now people are reading it on their watches like Dick <laughs> Tracy. Read a content curator, read your local paper, read a national paper, get the headlines. You don't like sports? Well, too bad. The other people do, and don't assume women don't like sports because just 
get around the basketball time. And if you're from the Bay Area, we are Golden State Warrior fans, and we love our Steph and our Kevin and uh, the whole gang. Now, you know this is Cavs country over here. So. I know you're <laughs> Cavs country. I understand that you are. I know. And I happen to be a fan of King James, and I follow him on Twitter. Now, for those of you who don't know who King James is, it's not the one that wrote the Bible. <laughs> I'm talking about? Mr. LeBron. Is still LeBron James, who, by the way, is the producer of one of my favorite TV shows, Survivor's Remorse on Stars. There you go. Yeah, a smart guy who diversified. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting point. Diversify, diversify, have diverse networks, diverse interests. When you read that paper, it's not just about your interest. You're going to talk to a lot of different people. Read the business page. Read the local community page, find out what's going on in the schools, find out if they passed a, a, a rule about the water district, find out what's going on in your profession, read and come to every event with three to five topics you could talk about in case there's a lull in conversation. And what I do is I get the week, every day I get 10 things that you need to know today around the world, the community, sports, anything interesting. And most of it I've read, but it's a nice encapsulation, especially if you're running out the door to an event. It's it's honestly the one of the biggest lifesavers. One of and a tip from us that you may like to use as well. We have a podcast called not us, but we listen to it. it's called How Stuff Works, and it's oh. it's stuff you should know. And you'd be in, you'd be amazed about how many conversations we've had about concrete or jackhammers or jellyfish <laughs> or some ra completely random subject. But if you can talk coherently, whether it's the headline news, sports, business, or pistol shrimp, you become an engaging conversationalist. Absolutely. Um, and you know, in so many events, people wear name tags. They are your biggest hint of what to talk about. But sometimes we go to events without name tags. So when you know how stuff works, and isn't that based? I saw that book in the bookstore. How it's based on the person I think who wrote that, and you just don't know. And I'm not a very good um, cook or anything, but I learned from a how stuff works YouTube video how to poach an egg in a microwave. <laughs> My world changed. <laughs> That's it. And if you can have those conversations, it, it makes your confidence level go up, your, you stand properly, and having, like you said, those three or four topics prepared previously lets you have that go-to if the conversation does run to a lull. And you know, and I will say this, I had a friend who I thought was really bright, and she was, master's degree, high IQ, well-read. And I remember I mentioned someone to her that is really in the national conversation, well-known, not a Kardashian, couldn't care less about them. Um, I was astonished she never heard of the person because I'm thinking, Do you, have you not read a paper? Have you not turned on TV for the news? And I'm going to say something that some people might find odd. When someone says to me or I read that they say, oh, I don't listen to the news, it's too depressing. I think, what a dumbbell. The news, you should know what's going on. Don't do it all day long like I sometimes do, which is a little bit much. But if you don't know what's going on in your community, in your city, in the country, in the world, we're now in a global economy. I have pals all over the world. I hear something happens in the UK. I'm right away checking in with my friends. Are you okay? I know you live in London. Are you okay? I know you live in Cairo. Are you okay? I know you live in Brussels. Really, we can't. it's enough that as a nation we are ignorant in terms of speaking multiple languages. We should not be ignorant about the news in other countries. I'm saying this because I grew up with a mother who is from Canada. She had to know all of our states capitals, what's going on. And I had to learn from her, the provinces. They don't teach us that in the schools. So I think we need to embrace 
a bigger world than just ourselves. Please read the paper. I think so. And one of the things you, you mentioned there, I want to take apart and dissect a little bit. And you said sending messages to people all over the world. And I think social media and email and the internet has brought us together in so many ways, but in the sa- at the same time, how have you seen this affect people who can only stare at that phone, no longer know how to have a face-to-face communication? So how do we draw the line of where to use technology in a good way for keeping in touch versus knowing when it's too much of a hindrance and we can't do basic communication anymore? Well, I do see what you say. You know, it brings us together in so many ways. But here's the thing. I just sent a friend of mine a note. I was at their wedding this summer. And I said, I have been seeing you on Facebook. And my brains have been thinking we've been in touch. But we haven't been. When can we get together? And we just set a December date. You know, if I'm at your wedding in August, why am I not seeing you for, you know, four months? We should not be lulled into thinking that we really are in touch with people just because of social media. But social media has interfered. When I first did my research for How to Work a Room, Dr. Philip Zimbardo, who is one of the founders of the Stanford Shyness Clinic, found that 80% of us American adults self-identify as shy. By the time we came out with the next version in 2000, I got a phone call from a fact checker there were such things in those days, who said, Susan, it's not 80%. Oh, really? She goes, it's 93. She checked. Oh, my goodness. But I did read that Dr. Zimbardo said, when asked what he attributed that big jump in people self-identifying as shy, he said technology. That was before we had texting, before we could poke or jab or whatever it is we're doing to each other that sounds so evil and destructive. I think it's incumbent about families, because this is a really big issue around the family dinner table. There should be a no phone rule. But I have to tell you, I go to the local place where I get my bagels, and they say, no phones at the register. Someone's trying to take your order, and you're talking to someone else. You're wasting their business time the post office, my post office here. I also take pictures of the no cell phone rule. I think it's kind of cool. This, our post office, you're, you've got, you're ordering stamps, you're sending a package, and you're talking to someone else. That means you're wasting and imposing not only on that person's time that's being paid, but the line of people behind you. So I think we have to have some respect. Parents do have to have phone free time. But here in, I live in San Francisco Bay Area, they're now having events where you check your phones at the door. Wow. A a different generation, the Gen Z, the younger ones, they now want to have this. They're wearing their grandfather's watches or their great grandfather's watches. Maybe they're looking at their phones for time, but they're, they're treasuring things. They're a little bit different than the one generation before them. We can't lose the face to face for a variety of reasons. If you're gonna start or grow a business, if you're going to try to communicate with potential clients, potential investors, potential business partners, customers, you better know how to talk to people. Um, You wanna get into a school. Yeah, you, uh, I just know the whole, you pay $100 to apply for a school online, but at some point someone actually talks to you. Right. At a job, at, at a, an internship. Oh, I'm going to do an internship so I can get into a new school. Well, you better learn how to have a conversation. I think it's incumbent on our schools to do that. And it's something I know most parents I know really want their children to be able to talk, not just to their peers, but to adults. That's, it's so huge because it's such a differentiator if you can have that personal interaction and in conversation confidence to look up from the phone or the device and have knowledge that's in your head that you can talk to off the cuff. It, it lets that other person know that you're engaged, you're in the conversation, you're paying attention. There's, there's a limitless number of skills that that shows when you're able to have a face-to-face conversation. Right. And you know what, when I wrote face-to-face that got published in October of 2008, face-to-face, 
How to Reclaim the Personal Touch in a Digital World. My book came out literally the week the market crashed. But I had been seeing that for since 2004, because I just went and found the original book proposal. We really need to develop interaction, and it's based on something that the research I found for How to Work a Room. Um, there was a, and, the, and it still applies, a professor emeritus at Harvard in sociology who said, in the year 2000, what will differentiate people who are a success will be their ability to talk to other people, not text other people, not poke other people, but the ability to do what we're doing, Brandon. We're having a face-to-face -face conversation because you can see that we're side by side. Now, the truth is that's different than in person. An in-person conversation, you've got to be able to do that. You're going to do that with the people when you go and buy something, if anyone actually walks into a store anymore. And by the way, if you're not sure how to interact with people, get some practice. Walk into your bank and talk to the teller. And I'm laughing because one of my friends told me, and I actually used it in a book proposal, a couple years ago, there was a young gal standing in line with her in front of her in the bank, who must have been about 23 or 24. Nice little suit, obviously work. Very nervous. My friend said to her, are you okay? She said, well, I've never done this before. So she thought, oh my God, she's going to rob the bank. <laughs> she said, what is it that you haven't done? She goes, I've never been in a bank and talked to anyone from the bank. So if you wow. want to get good at it, do that. And when you're in the grocery store and you're in line, talk to the people in back of you. You know, have the incidental conversations that you may not ever see these people again, but you'll develop the confidence in practicing. On an airplane, don't take someone's time, but in, a, in an airport. I have a new dear friend that I met because we sat next to each other waiting for a delayed plane from Charlotte to San Francisco. What we saw was a policeman with a canine police dog. We knew something was up. And then they announced, oh, there was a slight delay due to whatever. And both of us at the same time rolled our eyes and said, yeah, right. Obviously, we have the same communication pattern. <laughs> but we are now really good friends. She lives in Florida. We've seen each other. We stay in touch. I've been with her and her husband and her granddaughter. So, folks, everywhere you go, talk to people. If I could leave you with nothing, the Susan Rowan mantras, talk to strangers. I love it. It's those low stakes environments like the grocery store, like the bank, like the waiting in line where you have nothing to lose and everything to gain by making simple conversation and being polite. And it's being polite. Thank you for saying that. It's being polite. It's noticing people, but I'm going to play it another way. Sometimes, especially when there are senior citizens in Sometimes you might be the only person who's engaged or said something to some people. They talk about the rise in loneliness of people, just noticing people and pay attention to people. Um, when I see anyone, well, as you can tell, I have white bangs, but when I see anyone with beautiful white hair, I say something, oh my God, your hair is beautiful, male or female. I always hear an answer, oh, this happened early in life and this is why it happened. Sometimes that conversation, low stakes that you say, is the kindest thing you could do for someone who may not have someone that has talked to them in a long time. So this may sound like, oh my God, this is not a how-to podcast. This is really a how-to podcast. But it's also a when-to, and what I'm saying is why we should. I love it. Now... When it comes to you know these conversations and starting conversations just in everyday life, what are some of the biggest differences between like men and women? If you're going to break down entering a room and you're working the room, what are some ways that you can make that gender jump per se? Okay, so not to sound like Gloria Steinem, but there is a big difference. In fact, when I wrote Secrets of Savvy Networking, truly my favorite book, I had a chapter called 
from two different planets, men and women communicating. My editor loved it. Can you expand that? I was so tired of the book, I dropped the chapter. What was I thinking? Two years later, John Gray came out with Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, and I blew it. Um, first of all, I think this is now a global world, but it's also a world that men and women are working together. Men can take a lesson from women. We're not all of us, but my friend Ivan Meisner, who founded BNI, he finds that women are relational, men are often transactional. And that's not the case for everyone. Um, Tom Peters, the guru in search of excellence, et cetera, I heard him speak when that book came out. And then he and I were on a program together um, a number of years later. And I sat in his session taking notes. And he said, and in the next decade, what will be important in business is that we have people who have um, communication skills, that they relate, and blah, blah, blah. And then he said, we already have those people in the business world. We call them women. And boy, did he get a round of applause. So I think we can borrow from each other. Um, I should probably be a little more transactional. And when someone says, can I pick your brain, which by the way, I do own pick my brain consulting.com and as my consulting business, I should charge you. Oh, but I can't help but think what five, 10 minutes. If it makes your life a little easier, I should be more transactional, but if we can borrow from each other of what works, we are now talking about everything is relationships. Some women are not good at it and some men are great at it. Here's what I would say. Find the role models that you see in your own life of people who've really built relations, really communicate well, honor the people that they know. But start looking at them as what is it that they do? Start make a list. What do they do that makes you feel good, makes you feel important, makes you feel connected? And also pay attention to what they don't do and what they say and what they don't say. I know it's an old school term, but a proven term, but sometimes we now call that having filters. Just because you think it doesn't, doesn't mean to come out of your mouth. Say it. Absolutely. Um, I, I once had a, a high school friend, I, I'm not friends with anymore, but I remember she said, you know, Suze, I tell it like it is. So I wrote an article that said, and my only response to that is, please don't. Because really, you telling it like it is is only an opinion. It's not a fact. The savvy networker, the person we're trying to connect with, whether you're male or female, sometimes the best answer is none. Are you proving a point? My best friend is a CPA, and she always says to me, before we say something and do something, here's the question to ask ourselves. What would be the point? She asked me about that because I was planning some revenge. I'm the only person that admits that I love revenge. And all the other people say they don't, but they're lying. <laughs> um, and I told her what I was going to do. And she, she, when the, then she, oh, no. I go, well, no, no, no. It would just be uh, just desserts for that person. She goes, again, what would be the point? So ask yourself that question. What's my motivation? What would be the point? But men and women, I think, are now borrowing from each other, which is really good. But we still need to really focus on building relationships because that's everything that people are talking about in business. You have a relationship with someone, they're happy to recommend you. You have a relationship with someone, they're happy to introduce you to uh, their best client. You have a relationship with someone, they're happy to introduce you to their literary agent. You have a relationship with someone, it starts with a conversation it it grows with more conversation and then you build respect you build trust and then that trust has to be the core of everything ongoing once you do something that loses the trust very hard to regain it that was a long answer 
did, did I put an answer in there anywhere? You did. You did. And then we circled around and you answered what was going to be my next two questions as well. So all wrapped I up. beat you to the punch. You beat me to the punch. And so one of the things I was going to, I was going to ask and circle back and you mentioned, but we didn't get down to okay. is we talked about uh, inspiration and looking up to leaders and mentors. And so I want to ask you, who is an inspiration to you? I've been very lucky in that there are people in so many different um, professions and phases and different centuries that are inspirations. I loved having grown up with, and by the way, the world's best career change from a Milwaukee public school teacher to prime minister of Israel, Golda Meir, was one that, I mean, as a woman, I mean, you know, Indira Gandhi, a woman running a country. These are women running countries that you're going, oh, good. She was also a teacher. So having, for me, having teachers, former teachers, that I found out Luciano Pavarotti used to teach elementary school while he was learning his singing, et cetera. I go, oh, my God, look at me. I have something in common. So I always, for me, role models were former teachers. Role models were women. For me, the inspiration came from people in my speaking profession, my friend Sheila Murray Bethel, my friend Patricia Fripp, um, my, my buddies, you know, Tony Alessandra, my buddy L. Walker, who's from uh, South Carolina. I mean, watching prose, um, hearing sermons that I loved that made me just go, oh my God, I'm, I'm awestruck by listening to people. So, but I take it everywhere. The inspiration could be um, going to the botanical garden and being in a rose garden and just, I take time to stop and smell the roses, literally. It could be a sunny day. And maybe this is, and I thought about this a lot. I think we can take inspiration from wherever inspiration exists. And when you open yourself up, I take inspiration from watching Jeopardy, if I can guess the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I had one day that I got the entire category and it was baseball. There you go. Myself. But take the inspiration. And sometimes it's from someone younger than us. I mean, I, they are now have been talking about reverse mentoring since the nineties when GE had their younger people do technical mentoring to their execs. So I sometimes find it from, you know, a 20 year old or a 10 year old that teaches me something I don't know. But if we say I'm only inspired by, we delimit the background. Just soak it up. I love going to museums. I love learning things that I didn't know. Um, I went to the Whitney Museum in New York, but I also learned about Alexander Calder and a little bit about, you know, Edward Hopper, who I knew. And I wasn't really that much of an art person. Now I'm loving art. It inspires me, makes me breathe differently. Find out what it is for you. Now, I, I try to be classy enough to love opera. It has not worked yet at all. But I love dance. And so I make sure that I see a lot of ballet and dance. I just try to have different experiences. So, And this is a word I would share with you. I do things that I normally wouldn't do, so I have something to talk about. Like the day I went um, jet skiing, oh my God, I still have a backache that I can remember. But I also went um, rappelling, which I think is an aptly named sport because it truly <laughs> held me. But more than that, more than that, I did it once. And it's an experience. So I would say to have a full life do things you normally don't do and you might not like because you never know. It's like eat a food that you haven't eaten. Give it a taste. Unless it's an anaconda, it's not going to kill you. <laughs> and you might just find it's your new favorite food. It's your new favorite food. So I like to do new things. I, I, some things I definitely won't do. Um, I don't know how to swim, so I actually am not signing up for a triathlon because you have to swim part of it and I don't know how and I don't I should learn I did take lessons but they didn't take so it's okay to not do everything 
but at least be aware of what's going on, that people who you lo know and love and adore are doing and are interested in. That's phenomenal advice. Now, here's some fun ones to finish up our, our lovely interview here. So two questions on books. The first one is of your books, where would you have, where would you recommend that someone start to go through the books that you've written so far? And then okay. what is, go ahead. And then what are some other book recommendations, yours or anyone else's that you would say are must reads? I think in order to start this process to make you comfortable and confident in any room, start with how to work a room. Luckily, I mean, I updated it the 25th anniversary edition. Um, you can get that through, you know, Kindle, you can get a print book, you can get an audio. So whatever methodology you like, that will work for you. Um, my very favorite book is Secrets of Savvy Networking, and that's what you should follow with. But I also wrote the trilogy on connecting and communicating. When I think, I went back and reread my book on conversation called What Do I Say Next? It was really solid of how you do it what you say, what you don't do, et cetera. Plus, I always could include cartoons in my books, so they're really a lot of fun. Um, so I do love that. Um, I also wrote a book that was a little out of my wheelhouse, but it was really one I loved. I called it You Never Know, How to Turn Serendipity to Success, and unfortunately, Wiley called it How to Create Your Own Luck. Uh, but most of us have had You Never Know experiences. So I'd like you all to go to every event Look at your calendar when you get an invitation. If it's open, RSVP, say yes, and then show up. And now that's the magic part. Because uh, by the way, if you RSVP and say, I'm going to be there, and you don't show up, you start impacting your own reputation. So that's read books, go online, read snippets, go to my website. There's a lot of you can read for free in the blog because, you know, we have to give you. Um, I'm the former teacher, so your quiz will be next week. And a couple books that I really like and authors who I think have something to say that are helpful. One is Jenny Blake, who wrote Pivot. You're all, I think it's the most important thing is your next job or something, but Pivot by Jenny Blake. And Dory Clark, who wrote her new book, Entrepreneurial You, of how you can put together those side revenue stream. She also wrote um, Stand Out and Reinventing You. So Dory Clark, her recent book and her first book were by Harvard Press. And I think Portfolio did her second book, um, Stand Out, and they did Jenny's book, um, Pivot. Those books are really, I think, very important books. But also, you can go online and look on a subject, but I'm going to make a statement. Walk into a bookstore and touch those books. Go to the section that has the books you're interested. There might be a book that you had never thought of, but you picked it up and you go, oh, this interests me. And go to a library, for God's sakes. <laughs> Absolutely. Sorry. Now, what's, what's new in the Susan Rowan pipelines? What, what products are you currently working on? Where can everyone find out more about you and, and whatnot? Share, share a little bit about what's happening. Okay, well, I am working on a new book, and it's just in the proposal stage. I'm very excited about it, and I'm still waiting to hear from my agent. Uh, we have a couple publishers that are interested, but we'll see what happens. I can't tell you too much about it, but I'll tell you. When it comes out, it's going to be the book you want because it's going to be, shall we say, finishing school for the person that's already has their network of how to comport themselves in their career in business. And it's going to be practical, down to earth, fun, but it's the, it's something that I've done as a program for years. I've talked about this. By the way, any book on networking, I've already used the terms and written the material. It's the nuances. Some of us fall down because we don't know the nuances. We don't have the savvy, which I branded savvy networking. But this one is going to be um, a little different. And I'm thinking it'll uh, weigh a little less. I'm not going to write a doorstop. 
I finally had the idea to go, why put in 25 chapters when I can write two books? <laughs> you know? yeah. So that thing on that, but also upcoming is I'm very known for my holiday party do's and don'ts. So we're going to give you access to that through Brandon's blog. Um, and what I do and what I love mostly is speaking and working with companies and universities and conferences because the idea of helping people get up and talk to each other. I just done for my third year back at UC Berkeley's Bolt School of Law. That was great fun. And then one of the sessions we had um, lawyers from all over the world. They were great. And um, to me, that's it. So if you know of anyone that says, oh my gosh, we really need to train the people at the company of how to talk to people. Um, I did that recently at NASDAQ's Entrepreneurial Center here in San Francisco. And there, in fact, I'll let you know about it. There will be um, little interview bites with me of tips that people can have. And go to my website and go to my YouTube. I have a ton of little um, how to talk to the big kahuna, um, et cetera. Um, little tips that'll get you going. Um, this is the old ex-teacher part, give people what they need. So I'm working on that. Plus, I tweet four times a day. Follow me on Twitter. Such a time waster, but it's my favorite time waster next to days of our lives. <laughs> uh, but I go follow me on Twitter. Um, I have a Facebook business page that you can find, and I give a lot of business information. And I'm really, about LinkedIn, I do a lot of posting on LinkedIn. I find that a lot of people invite you to LinkedIn and then they disappear. So here's the point. If you connect with people on LinkedIn, stay in touch or ask for an email to go off LinkedIn so you can develop the conversation. Just to add them to your list of people does not mean you have a relationship. And I'd like to give you this, to have a network, to have friends, it doesn't matter how many people in Facebook are on your list. Make sure that when someone you know invites you to a party, invites you to go out for um, a meal, invites you to come to an, uh, just an informal gathering, go out with people. And you can start your own network. Invite five people you know and say, hey, we're all in tech or this and that. Why don't you invite five people not in tech and let's have a dinner and come up with a topic. If you really want to develop your conversation skills, do that. Have everyone go around the room, say what they're doing, and you will see this phenomenal amount of interaction. So you be the catalyst, you be the host, you be the inviter. So that's my long-winded answer. But I do have one answer. I don't know, you haven't asked me the question, but I thought about it a lot. Of who... I'd want to have dinner with. That was my next question. I thought about it. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I, she is, first of all, I pray for her good health. That's number one. Number two, um, she is a, fen a phenom in so many ways. And her nickname is the Notorious RBG, which I totally <laughs> love. And when I was at Bolt School of Law, there was a picture of her, and I had them take a picture of Ruth and moi. So I would love to have dinner with her. Uh, she also works out with a trainer, so we could compare points. But, but she is a person I think is fascinating, who has been on the Supreme Court a long time. And what's most interesting about her is one of her best friends on the Supreme Court was the guy who was at the opposite end politically but they both loved opera. Anthony Scalia. You never know what those little things that put people together that goes beyond what we think is the obvious differences. That's exactly it. And now the last and final question. Is there anything that you wish I had asked or do you have any final words of wisdom? Um, I wrote this down, but then I already said it because I wrote it down and I remembered it then. Um, if I had to give you one or two tips, the, the one I would reiterate is go everywhere to have a good time and talk to strangers. 
you know, sometimes the strangers are the people that will lead you to other people or other information where if you're only talking to the people you already know, you limit yourself. And please, please, please go everywhere and be nice to everyone. Because you never know. Have a diverse network. The person that looks like you, sounds like you, etc. It's great to have some of those, but have people that look and sound and believe differently or from different geographic areas. Because life is rich and, and diversity is richness. And then you will get diversity of information, diversity of cultures, diversity of know-how, diversity of know-who, diversity of uh, common knowledge. So those are my three tips that I would give you. And then you go out to the restaurants that they go to, and then you get new food you can eat. I love it. Susan, it has been an absolute pleasure. You have shared some incredible wisdom, some actionable tips and tricks, some wonderful stories along the way. And I truly thank you for spending time out of your busy day to be here with us. This has been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Brandon. I'm so glad. And we will absolutely be in touch. And that's a wrap. What did you think? Let us know your favorite tip that you learned in the comments below. If you know someone who needs a bit of inspiration, go ahead and send them a link to this video. I know that they will appreciate it. Below, I've included links to Susan's website, her books, and all of her programs. So if there's something that we talked about and you want to find out a little bit more, I made it super easy all in the description box below. As always, please click subscribe right down there in the corner so that you never miss a video and turn on the alerts so you'll know that when we post a video, you'll get it coming your way. Don't forget every Wednesday we've got new interviews with experts and influencers so that you can learn the very best tips right from the source. Mondays are life lessons from your favorite TV shows and Friday we've got difficult behaviors and personality breakdowns. So we've got something for everyone. Last but not least, don't miss open enrollment on our Millennial Magnetism course. Click the link in the description box below for more details about how you can unleash your inner awesome in only 10 minutes a day. Until next time, ciao for now.